Welcome in to the Storycraft Cafe. I am your host, Hank Garner. Today, super excited to have Sarah Cannon join us here on the show. Uh, Sarah is is uh, a fantasy writer, a paranormal writer, uh, writing mostly, and, and I say mostly because, Sarah, you can do whatever you want to, but <laughs> you write YA, young adult, um, that seems to really be your wheelhouse, paranormal stories, um, normal people that you could relate to that just happen to be in really odd situations. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But Sarah also uh, has an online presence and she uh, has a site and a YouTube channel called Heart Breathings that is so amazing. And I love it. And I love following you, Sarah. And uh, just so excited to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited. I already see some of my hearties in the comments already checking Absolutely. us out, which is fun. Um, yes. Welcome in, everybody. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. So good to see you guys here. This is going to be fun. I love talking about stories. So thanks for Absolutely. having me. Yeah, absolutely. I love, uh, I do too. And so glad that we get to do this, you know, every week. Um, one thing I like to do, Sarah, in the beginning of a show is to start with a fun question uh, to kind of set the tone for the show. And one thing that I love to ask people, I've got a couple of questions that I kind of bounce back and forth through, but I thought this would be a fun one to start with. What is a piece of writing advice that you got from somebody uh, somewhere along your author journey, maybe it was in the beginning when, you know, you were unpublished and, you know, really trying to work your craft. And maybe this piece of advice um, was a just nugget of gold that you hold on to and you think, oh, I'm so glad this person shared this advice with me and it's done wonders for me. Or maybe it was a piece of advice that was so terrible that you hold on to and just look back and laugh about and think, Oh, I'm so glad I didn't do that. Or I wish <laughs> not have listened to that advice. Or maybe you have one of each. Feel free to, to tackle that <laughs> question any way you want. I definitely have a one of each. So all right. I was hoping so. <laughs> <laughs> the, they and they they dovetail together quite nicely because my probably the most effective piece of writing advice I ever got was not from a writer. It was from okay. my husband who um, said to me, "Stop worrying so much about what's going to sell, and just write what you want to write, and then we'll figure out how to make money at this later." And mm. I had the, I had the privilege of, I was able to quit my teaching job. And my husband was like, what do you want to do? Like, he was just trying to get me to move closer to where he was. He was like, quit your job and I'll support you. What is it you want to want to do with your life? And I was like, well, I've, I've always wanted to be a writer. And I spent those first few years just studying publishing blogs and the market and what's going to sell and trying yeah. to create what. I thought people wanted from me and it was really holding back my creativity because I would be like, Oh, there's too much vampire stuff. I can't write that. Or I can't write this or I can't write that. Or people say why I doesn't sell as well. I got to write adult stuff, but I really want to write why I, and mm -hmm. when he gave me that permission kind of, and said, just write what you love and then we'll figure out how to make money on it later. Just follow your heart. That was the soul best. And then the whole reason I started a YouTube channel later in my career is because of um, there was a thread in an author Facebook group, probably I think back in 2016, 2017, that I saw some people had tagged me in it where they were asking this exact question, like, what's the best advice mm -hmm. you ever got? And um, somebody like several people, as I was reading through those comments said, the best advice I ever got was, you know, forget writing what you love, write to market, write like it's a business, write every day, whether you feel like it or not. And it's not that that's always the worst advice because we do need yeah. to take the market into consideration. It is a part of it. But when you say completely forget writing what you love and focus solely on what everyone tells you sells and only on what the market is going to, like we live in a world right now where the market is open to literally anything you can think of. Right. The market is so much more wide open than it ever has been in the history of writers existing. 
And so if you have a passion for something and you do it well, you can find an audience. And I think it's terrible advice to tell people, this is the way you have to do it. You have to, you cannot write what you love. You have to write what the market wants. I think, I think that's the worst advice. You know, um, I hear that. I, I hear both sides of that argument all the time. Um, yeah. Over the last 10 years, we've done like 1500 different author interviews and there you hear right to market, treat it like it's a business. This is not, um, you know, what you're passionate about. It's what's going to sell. And there's so many formulas about dialing into exactly what is hot in the market and how to generate books fast and get them out there. And then you've got the other side where people are like, who cares if you're constantly chasing the market, you're always going to be one. You're always going to be behind the curve because whatever's selling right now, it's going to take you 60 days to publish a book. If you're doing it fast, even if you're fast, you know, then, yeah. you know and, and so you, you hear both sides of this, you know, that, well, is yeah. it a, I mean, well, first off, I don't know a single person, that got into writing and publishing to make a buck. Um, yeah. There, there are plenty of people that have figured out how to, and 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 say, well, this was already a passion of mine, and I can make money at it. You know, double win. Yeah. But I don't know anybody that just said, you know what, I'm going to get rich quick. I'm going to become an author. Right. <laughs> it's, it's just not how that usually works. You know, there are There's, easier ways to make money. In the world. Exactly. Exactly. I think the reason we hear both sides of that argument mm -hmm. is because they're both true. And right. we each as individuals have our own priorities. And for some people, they're happy to write whatever they whatever the market wants, I'll write it. I'm as long as I'm writing right. romance, I'll write it. Or as long as I'm writing fantasy, I'm there. Um, and then there are other people who think, no, this is the thing of my heart. And there's, I think part of the problem is that we don't always just make room for everybody. Like, okay, neither one is invalid. Neither one is bad. It's great right. to make money. It's great to write to market if you want to, but I think it's bad advice for someone to say that you have to. And that's really the the thing. I think it's super, super important, of course, to understand the market, to know how to package your work so that you're reaching the right readers. That's really part of the key thing of marketing is not, I mean, it's great when you can write your book to market, but it's also, you could write the most marketable book in the world, but if you don't package it right with the right cover and the right blurb and the right marketing, it's still not going to find its audience. So there's lots of pieces to this puzzle. But if if you are someone who is writing from your heart and you're passionate about story, write the most passionate thing you have that will also sell. <laughs> and when you can find that that convergence between something that's marketable that people want to read, but man, you're so passionate about it, that's when you really find the magic, in my opinion. So would it be fair to say, um, figure out what you're passionate about, figure out how to write that well, and then figure out how to package and sell that thing with, is that, is, does, does that kind of, if there was, if there was down? ever a true formula, I think that's, that's a okay. big part of it. But I do think there are also people that come to the table and just think, I love story and story has changed my life, but I'm not sure what I want to write. And so, you know, sometimes that piece of figuring out what I'm passionate about can take time. And I think just giving yourself permission to explore and try new things, maybe write short stories, read widely across a lot of genres. Some people know, they're like, this is the yeah. thing, this is my thing. And some people don't know. And I think that, you know, it we need to give ourselves that patience of saying, I don't know, I'm going to try this and see if I'm good at it. And sometimes even people will say, write what you love to read. But I don't think that's the case for every author either. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Um, I I love to read all kinds of stuff, and I absolutely suck at writing about half of those things. You know, so yeah, oh that's gosh. that's not yeah. always very great <laughs> advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're gonna come back to writing and publishing in just a second. But did I hear that you um, studied opera and <laughs> and wanted to be an opera singer? I did. I. 
you know, when I went off to college in, in the first place, we won't discuss what year that was exactly. However, <laughs> when, when I went off to college, I decided to double major. I did not major in creative writing, but I just majored in English and then also yeah. in vocal performance. And that led to a master's degree in opera, uh, summer internships, working with a soprano from the Metropolitan um, Opera in New York. And wow. uh, lots of lots of fun performances and opportunities. And it, it's so funny because now it feels like a different version, like some different version of me in the past. Like I don't even remember who that girl was, but it, <laughs> it was a dream for a while. And I still love listening to opera. But how do you go from being uh, um, living in a log cabin in the Georgia woods <laughs> to opera how, how did how do you make that connection you know i my passion this this is probably where things kind of come back around to following your passion because my passion was not opera my passion was broadway okay and i grew up with parents who love love loved fiddler on the roof and music man and you know hello dolly and <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to sing for you guys today, but maybe we <laughs> never know. Uh, I do have some recordings on SoundCloud. I think if you actually just Google Sarah Cannon SoundCloud, you can get my entire like senior recital from my college experience. If you want to check that out. Um, okay, guys, but, you heard it here. <laughs> but I, my parents loved musicals. And so I grew up being in musicals on stage and loved it, loved it. But then once I went off to college, the school that I chose was just much more classical and it was something that everybody just kept kind of telling me your voice is meant for this. You were meant to sing opera. This is who you were meant to be. And I allowed that to influence me of like, okay, I'm going to follow what everybody else tells me I should do. And it wasn't that I didn't enjoy opera, but it was a combination of things. One that I really truly wanted to do Broadway and in the classical training environment, they were like, no, Broadway is not as good. Like it was very judgmental toward Broadway. And I didn't realize that when I got into that. So I was almost scared or embarrassed to say, this isn't what I want to do. Cause I had just spent a lot of money to get a degree in yeah. this. Uh, yeah. And then secondly, I knew I didn't want to do it when once you get on stage and you actually start getting roles, I thought I'll have the freedom to sing it the way I want to sing it. Like my interpretation. That's not true. <laughs> they say, oh, go to the you know library and listen to this recording of Mirella Freni doing this and sing it just like she did. And I didn't want anyone telling me what to do. So then it's no surprise when I started publishing, I only submitted ever to one agent. And she was like, oh, I'm not sure this is the story for me. And I was like, you know what? I think there's this new thing called a Kindle and there's a couple people publishing to it. I'm going to try that instead. And <laughs> Emily says, imagine your books made into a musical. Okay. That's going to be my <laughs> new, that'll be my new goal in life. That would be so much fun. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, One thing that most writers that I know, uh, Sarah, have some other form of artistic expression yeah. that that they relate to. Uh, maybe they're not great at it, but they they relate to it in some way. Um, and and uh, this is another question I love to ask people: Is were there anything, any tools um, that you picked up from singing, vocal performance, that side of your life, that have helped you? in your writing life or publishing. And, and maybe your answer is like you just said, the, the deciding to, uh, to indie publish uh, through Kindle because you felt the, the freedom um, there. But um, is, is there anything that you picked up from that side of your life that you bring into your writing life? Yeah, I think so. I think number one, you know, we see people on stage performing, but what you don't see is the hours and hours and hours of practice and learning how to use your voice and how to not only express yourself, but read the music and how to use your lung capacity in the right way, how to pronounce right. this German translation. You know, there's there's so many different pieces that go into that one, you know, 10 minute performance on stage. And 
So I think it taught me that discipline of every day you're in there, you're practicing, you're doing the work that's kind of invisible. Nobody else can see you in there and it's up to you to sit down and do it. And writing is very much like that. You have to, you can't just show up and write a novel in five minutes. Like it's that day to day, you know, practice of getting in there and learning how to do it. And I think also the confidence of getting on stage, being able to trust myself, trust my voice, helped me to trust my voice when it came to a different expression of that, which is is the writing. And interestingly, I think too, being part of, you know, Broadway, opera, you're part of storytelling, even art song and aria, you're storytelling. And so that sort of pacing and understanding that translated so much into understanding pacing as a writer as well. And I didn't realize that until earlier this year in a conversation I was having with Leslie Penelope and Ines Johnson. I said, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how much I learned pacing from the pacing of music when it speeds up and you've added that tension and then you need that moment of release. And it's very much like scene and sequel when you're writing. So I think that's true. And then of course that carries into YouTube that I got comfortable on stage. I got comfortable being criticized all the time and that I think gave me a little push to be okay putting my face on YouTube for people to say what they think of me. <laughs> Speaking of Ines, uh, she was on the show just a couple of weeks ago, and you know what a what an amazing um, community that has really grown up around publishing and indie publishing specifically. Um, you know, back in the early days, um, I. I indie published my first book about 2013 at the end of 2013, beginning of 2014. So I was a, a couple of years behind you, but I remember, you know, it was really the wild west of publishing, you know, back then and that first kind of wave of the Kindle revolution. And it really has grown into a very mature community. And, yeah. and I, I would challenge anyone to, to say that indie publishing is not, as valid as mature as uh and, and, and producing as good a work as anybody is uh, on the and it's and it's because of all these amazing people that have grown up grown this community up around it it's it's really in a it, in a fantastic place right now and and i think it really is putting the the power back in the in the writer's hands where where it belongs i think yeah i completely agree with that and i i think that it is it, it's changed and it's been interesting to be a part of the industry of the, you know, the indie side of, of digital publishing. Cause I started in 2010, which was definitely on the earlier side of things. And it's that transformation of Mm -hmm. at first it was the wild West and it was kind of anything goes and your cover doesn't have to be that great because your book's only 99 cents. And, you know, really you 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 remember all the covers that were just made in Microsoft word. You should, you should see my first covers that like, I have a few of them here, but none of these are my first covers. My first covers um, were not that great, but it was okay. Uh, We found our way, we figured it out. And that's part, that was part of the fun of it was the excitement of something new and you could do whatever you want. And it was easier to be discovered because there was just less competition back then. But now there's just every amazing series and book and author that gets established raises the bar for everybody else. Like, okay, let's make sure we do have our books edited and we are marketing them the correct way. And that, that adds a new level of challenge, but also a new level of professional, you know, presentation and and all the things that we have to learn and do. But I think it, it's a good stretch for all of us, but I do think it's, I don't want to say harder to publish now because there's also way more ways to advertise and to get your books in front of people. And there's uh, so many more softwares and other things that we can use that tools that we can use to, to help us go to market. But at the same time, there's a lot to learn. And I think that's one of the biggest barriers right now for indies is the, not just the sheer amount of what we have to learn and be good at excellent at, but also the overwhelm that comes with how do I get it all done? Especially if you still have a full-time job or you have kids at home or you have a chronic illness or, you know, other things like that, it can be, that can be a big challenge, which is another reason I started Heart Breathings. 
that was a perfect segue because the next thing <laughs> I was going to ask is what does heart breathings mean? And where, where did this whole side of, of your online presence and your, um, you know, the, the things that you do, where, where did this come from? So heart breathings comes from the Wordsworth quote, fill your paper with the breathings of your heart. I actually have it tattooed for not for the podcast. You can't see it, but for those of you on, on YouTube, um, I got this tattooed um, on my body for my 40th birthday. And it all goes back to that original piece of advice, right? What you love most of all. And that to me is what that quote really means is fill your paper with the breathings of your heart. Just really pour yourself into your writing and that's what becomes magnetic. And I started the YouTube channel, like I said, because I wanted to be a voice for it's okay to write what you love and to actually, even if somebody says, oh, that's never going to sell or it's not going to be the number one bestseller on Amazon there is more to this business than just being number one or making a million dollars a year. It's there. It's also a soul level fulfillment and that is important. And I think not enough people were talking about that. I think we have more people in the community speaking out about that now. And then also I had, my husband called me a indie evangelist and I love that you have evangelist on your, (laughs) on your name there Um, because I, was so passionate about the path of taking your career onto your own hands and doing it yourself that I was talking about it all the time. And I ended up spending hours and hours of my time in private DMs with people, text messages with people. How did you do what you did? How do I get there? What can I do? And uh, finally said, okay, I need to put this up on some, uh, some kind of platform where I can just point people to the information and say it once. And then uh, everyone can can benefit from it rather than all happening in private conversations. So yeah. that that was where it all came from. And it, I never dreamed it would become what it has now, which is a huge community of of some of the best people I've ever known in my life, as well as a whole new life almost for my family. This has become, you know, part of who I am. And, and I love that. It's so awesome. Isn't it um, strange when you have that moment of realization that, um, you know, it, for so long, you your head is down, you're doing the work, you're, you know, putting books out, you're gaining an audience. And then all of a sudden, people start looking to you like, like you have some answers, like you, you know, and it's a very strange moment of realization when like, oh, I, I have been doing this a while. I have accumulated some knowledge, yea, yeah. even shall I say wisdom that, that might have come from mistakes I've made, successes I've had. Um, yeah. it's it's an odd transition when when you become, you know, the kind of the the um I want to say elder statesman, but that's not that's <laughs> not really what I I think the 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 wizened person who's who's you know, been down this path, been down um, the road a bit. Yeah, yeah. It, it's really an an odd thing that happens, isn't it? I I feel like it was a natural and pretty quick transition for me because I was in a pretty tight knit RWA community mm-hmm. in my when I was living in Raleigh, the Raleigh area, and several people, not everybody, but several people there were like, "Oh my gosh, you're making a huge mistake." Indie publishing means no no agent, no publishers mm-hmm. ever going to touch you, and that was kind of true in 2010. That like there were people that were saying, I, "I'm not going to even talk to you if, if I'm an agent and you're an indie published person." That's obviously changed for the better now, but um, yeah. so there was a lot of advice: don't do this. This is terrible. You're throwing away your career. But I knew it was right for me, and it was only a year later that they came to me saying, can you come speak to the group? Can you come, you know, and many other RWA groups were saying, how did you do this? Uh, Because I had found success somewhat quickly for myself. And now I'm trying to rebuild that because I spent the past three years pouring so much of my heart into heart breathings that that's another challenge. And when I talk to other people like Ines and, and others who have moved into this leadership position, coaching position, mm-hmm. where you're trying to share what you've learned, it can get really difficult to find that balance between, okay, I'm leading a group. I'm trying to share what I know. I'm trying to um, coach or teach or become an educator in this space. 
but I also need to be writing still. And that's been right. a big, that's probably been my biggest challenge over the last few years. So I, have you, um, have you discovered anything? Are there any tools that you've unlocked that help you to strike that balance? Because I, I know a lot of folks that, that find themselves and where they really start pouring into other people and you, you find that all of your energy goes there instead of the thing that got you to that place to begin with. That's, and it's such a heartbreaking position to find yourself in because you want to do this thing you've always been passionate about, but you're also passionate about helping others. And, yeah. you know, well, you, and you I, don't let either one. Slide. I think it's happening too, not just to those of us that have decided to teach courses or other things, yeah. but it also happens when you've been writing for a good while, you love it. And then suddenly you start to find some success because that balance starts to shift toward, I have to make the most of this. So how do I right. market better? I better get my books up on a Shopify store and I better do this. And the balance starts to shift from creative time and having that spaciousness to work on your books and daydream about them to marketing, 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 balance, you know, get, let me get this formatting. Let me learn this. Let me, you know, research and taking the courses and trying to figure right. it all out. And that balance for all of us, I think can be difficult. And it, for some people, it's not even just a balance between marketing and writing. It's also a balance between, Hey, I have this chronic illness that's, that's come up, or I've got a parent that I'm caretaking for now. So how do I find the time to write? And I think these tools will apply to everybody that what I've found for myself is it's not just about marking time on your Google calendar or whatever for writing, because you cannot pour from an empty cup. And right. I thought, you know, I knew my family was living in Airbnbs for like seven months and we were traveling around and different things were happening. And I knew that time was going to be slow. But once we got settled in this house, I thought, OK, I'm off to the races. I'm going to finish a book. Everything's going to go great. And I realized even though I was making my writing a priority in terms of time, nothing was nothing was coming out. It just felt like I'm focused so much on the deadline and the the. I don't want to say hustle of it because I was definitely not have not been in hustle of it, but just that <laughs> discipline of I got to sit down and this is my hour to write. But then the ideas weren't coming together. The the moments of magic, it, nothing was there. And I was feeling to say I was feeling frustrated was would be an epic understatement. <laughs> I was feeling despondent about it. Like, what if I just don't know how to write anymore? And I think that can happen with burnout. It can happen with balance. It can happen with a shift of focus. And the big thing that's been making the difference here over the last six months to a year is realizing I don't, I can't just make time for the writing itself. I have to make time for the filling of my creative well, for inspiration time. I have to give myself as frustrating it, as it is to be busy all the time and feel like there's just a never ending to-do list. I have to make, if I want to be a writer, I have to make it a priority to, right. in, to pour it back into myself. And that can feel very selfish as a mom to do. It can feel very scary as someone who makes my you know money online to say, okay, I'm going to pull away from what's bringing in the most income right now so that I can find this extra time. It can feel scary when you're trying to just build, 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 grow, grow, grow. And everybody tells you more momentum, more momentum. It's it's like you could add 50 more things to your list to do at any moment. We all could. There's a never ending list of things we could be doing more of or better or right. you know, marketing or whatever. And I think for me, it became this line I had to draw in the sand and say, this is non-negotiable for me. I am going to have a quitting time at night. I'm going to watch more anime. I'm going to go outside more. I'm going to walk around. I'm going to get off the computer. I'm going to set boundaries with how often I'm checking social media and comments. I'm going to stop thinking so much about anyone that's disappointed that it's taken me this long to write a new book because that, that energy is also draining me of right. feeling like I'm, behind or I'm disappointing anyone that is not, that's like pouring sand in the gas tank. And mm -hmm. so I started thinking, okay, what, what fuels me? What makes me feel like there's some sort of aliveness in my writing again? 
And that's like sitting down and watching. I know what you did last summer. And, uh, (laughs) you know, I'm, I'm currently writing a teen murder mystery kind of thing. So it's like watching something like that or an entire, somebody mentioned Buffy the Vampire Slayer, like a whole season of Buffy. And that feels so indulgent at this point in my career where I'm just, I have so much on my plate but it has been the single handed most important thing I've done for my writing this year. Yeah. You, you have to keep the well stocked it. That, that doesn't change what, whatever excited you in the beginning, you have to keep pouring that in there. And, and yeah. no matter how successful you become, those, those fundamentals never change. Yeah. And it, part of it too is navigating the ups and downs, because I think so often we think this career trajectory is going to be always Mm -hmm. up. Like, even if it's slow and steady, like a turtle, it's always up. Like we should, as long as we're building backlist, we should always be moving forward. But I don't think it works that way for anybody. I know this series does better than that one. Something happens with your new release and your pre-order gets canceled. Like there's going to be ups and downs throughout the whole thing. And I think another thing we don't talk about enough in the industry in, in balance with marketing and all the to-do list stuff is how do you handle your mental health when you're in a downswing? What if you've been, you put out, you know, for me, I had my biggest release ever has sold a hundred thousand copies in its lifetime, which is amazing. And I'm so proud of that. Yeah. But I can also use that number to feel really disappointed in my last release that only sold, you know, 15 or 20,000 copies where the truth is if you told Sarah who started in 2010 that she would ever have a book that sold 20,000 copies, she would have literally died on the floor from shock and excitement. But when we start to compare, like people will always say, don't compare yourself to other people, compare yourself to who you were yesterday. And I think, Oh, I don't know that that's healthy either. (laughs) Um, Especially if we're looking at numbers, because in this indie industry, there's going to be ups and downs. And I think we have to understand that those sales numbers, whatever result we're getting, because, you know, you could even just take a YouTube video, for example, since that this is true for TikTok and everything else, but I may post a YouTube video and it may be the least watched one. And it would be a a content I thought people would like, and there's 3000 views on it, or I might post something that I didn't even know people would like, and it has 16,000 views. And I don't really have control over that. I just have control over, I make the best video I can that I think my audience will find helpful, but I can't control how many people. And the same thing is true of our sales. The same thing is true of a Instagram reel that we post or, you know, a new release or anything like that. And I think it can be difficult to navigate because the highs feel so exciting the first time you hit them. Yeah. And then anything that doesn't quite match up to that feels like you're losing ground, you're losing momentum. And that's if you if you zoom out and you look over the long term, there's nothing that says just because I've gone from 100,000 sales of book 4 to 20,000 sales of book 11 that book 12 won't come out and end the series and I sell 10 million copies over the next 5 years. Like that can happen or it might not. But either way, sitting here, I'm still the best writer I can be. And I'm still a worthy, worthwhile, successful author, whether that was 10 sales or 10,000. And I think it's it can be difficult to feel that way when you feel like you're losing momentum or you've been at this for a long time and you're not seeing the results you want to see. And that in and of itself can drain the writing energy. Amen. Amen. Uh, perfectly said. Uh you said a few minutes ago you mentioned a uh, Shopify store. This is 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 something that I'm hearing all over, all over the publishing world. This is a new trend. Um, I I remember several years ago the Kindle store was the end all be all, and it's all that you would ever need. And now there are these other platforms that are popping up, and people are finding success. You know, over either as a uh, I don't I don't know that anyone's replacing their Amazon sales with what they're doing in other places. Oh, there some, are. Some might be. Yeah. Um, but it, it's definitely something that people are using to supplement. Um, mm-hmm. What are some of the changes that you're seeing, um, you know, being in the position that you are and 
and having a, a, a back list and are, are you seeing new places to market and w- like what is what's going on in the, in the Shopify space and like like is this an untapped uh, audience that that we haven't seen in publishing? I think, you know, I think anytime you have the, the entrepreneurial spirit, which we kind of all have to have to be indie right. authors to begin with, there's always going to feel constraints when you're, um, as my friend um, Shell Honaker always says, building on rented land. Like when you're, when you're building your entire audience on the Kindle store and then something happens and your latest release gets canceled and you don't have yeah. a rep you can talk to or you know, some, something happens on the store and no ranks are getting updated today. You start to feel that constraint or restriction of, I wish I had even more control. And of course, right. as Indies, we have a lot of control, but that next level of control feels like the n- next logical step for a lot of people. So I think that's why a lot of people are thinking, oh, well, I could make more money if I took control. If I'm, if I'm taking out Facebook ads anyway why am i sending them to amazon where i make 70 percent when i can send them to my website where i make 90 percent uh and i can give people discounts and i get their email address which is a really big one because i can talk about how many tens of thousands people have bought my books i can't contact any of them unless they opted into my website right or into my newsletter list right but if i was sending facebook ads to my personal website, they have to give me their email so I can deliver their books to them. And so now I have a new marketing channel where I can build funnels and tell, give them freebies and control every conversation I have with them. And of course, people can still unsubscribe, but I think that's the real appeal of Shopify. Plus, then you can create bundles like I could do a new release bundle for my next book that had a t-shirt and a mug and a paperback and it's, you know, a, a sticker and a pen. And there's a lot of people that would love that, but I can't do that on Amazon. And so there's, you know, I think people are looking for some of those types of solutions and doing interesting, cool things. And I, I think it'll be really fun to watch how that progresses into that creator economy that we're all kind of hearing about because you could create so like once you see that as a possibility of oh i could sell book boxes and bundles and all kinds of things the sky's the limit to what you can do but i think the challenge of course is it is very is you know once you talk about taking more control you're also giving up all the tools all the marketing all the visibility that comes with amazon or google play or apple books and yeah. Kobo and everywhere. And you're saying, okay, let me move everybody over to my own website and then have to build out funnels. And there's stuff you can't even imagine like, oh, I can't ship this to this country. So I need to change that. And I've got sales tax. And it just, if you think your to-do list is already this long, just wait till you try <laughs> to start a Shopify store and you're going to ship out physical products. And I think some people, because they're hearing that buzzword a lot, they're ready to jump in and they've got two books in their backlist. And it's going to be really difficult for the majority of people to make books that only, you know, you've only got one or two super profitable on a Shopify store. And so I think my word of caution would be don't jump into it until number one, you know everything you can about what's really involved in all the costs and plugins and other things like that. And you have some sort of proof of concept that your books are doing well and they're saleable and people are interested in them and you've got enough that you can bundle up and give deals and things like that. I, I haven't started a Shopify store yet, but it is on the list for this year. I'll bet it is. I'll bet it is. <laughs> I'm also starting the cool thing too. Like when we start talking about people branching out is I'm starting a Ream subscription, which if you haven't heard, are you familiar with Ream? I, I've I've heard of it. I, I've not gotten one, but, but I've heard some talk about it. I just launched my follower page, but it, there's no tiers yet for people to actually purchase. Cause I am finishing a book and then I'm going to start a project that's just specific for that. But that excites me a lot more personally than Shopify because it's basically a platform that's a combination of, of a social reader like Wattpad or Royal Road or, you know, some fan fiction sites you might've heard of with Patreon kind of functionality where you've got tiers and people can sign on at $5 a month or 
Um, and you have that consistent income that you can build and you can really build up community and have forums and other things. And this for me has brought me back to a newbie like passion <laughs> for for storytelling again, because I naturally write in cliffhangers and even my fans have lovingly started calling them Sarah hangers because <laughs> they're just, they're always there. Like you're not going to finish a Sarah Cannon book without a cliffhanger, except my upcoming book, which is um, the disappearance of Vanessa Shaw will be out hopefully in May. And uh, that one will not have a cliffhanger because it is my first ever true standalone novel, which wow. is maybe why it's taken me so long to write it <laughs> that's more difficult than i thought i love it i love it well, sarah i would i want to shift away from the business of publishing for a minute and and talk about something that is very prominent on in your online presence presences however you want to say it um you seem to love planners and highlighters and pins and boards where you put sticky notes and you have you know everything planned out for uh for where your books are plotted as someone who began as a pantser and has gradually made his way to be sort of a chaotic planner um mm -hmm. of sorts um i absolutely love to watch those videos of yours where where you go through your office setup and i see how everything is so neat and organized and you've got all of these tools that you've collected and i just but it, it makes the back of my head kind of burn and tickle yeah. a little bit <laughs> and um <laughs> because that seems to kind of be your nature and the 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 types of organization that you are uh drawn to uh does that translate to your writing like are you a an in-depth plotter at, like how much pre-writing goes into your writing projects. I do love planners. I'm so glad you brought it up because I, how long do we have on this? <laughs> as long as you need, as long as you need. Uh, I, I love it. I have always loved notebooks and planners and uh, pens and highlighters, but growing up, I grew up in a log cabin in the woods of Georgia with no air conditioning. We did not, like I never had a pair of shoes that wasn't a hand-me-down until I was in high school, I think. Uh, my first car was a $350 car that backfired. You know, we didn't have, we didn't have a lot growing up. Uh, so I didn't have, I had mostly, my mother was a teacher. And so her kind of hand me down worksheets that I could write on the back of and, you know, different things like that. Um, and so as an adult, and I started writing. So I was a teacher for a while as well, which we didn't really talk about, but I taught elementary school music after my life as an opera singer. And nice. as a teacher, you use a lot of those tools, post-it notes sure. and pens and highlighters. And that was, I loved that. So when I became a writer, I was like, oh, I can just go all out on index cards and, and stuff like that. And it really became a tool for putting my story together. And it's invaluable to me, not only just the, like, I, t obviously I type all of my stories, but when I am doing the pre-work, it's all handwritten and it will be up on my wall in color code. I write a lot of multiple POV. So I always need visually to be able to see those different characters, point of view and different colors. And I will do, it kind of depends on the, the story that I'm writing, but I always will do a basic three act structure of what's going on for each like main point of view character as best I can. I usually will know that first scene and I like to know what, how it's going to end. It always changes, but if I can put together in terms of the plot, those kind of tent poles that you, you think of the first act doorway and that mm -hmm. midpoint, especially the, mirror moment as James Scott Bell talks about, if I can right. have that figured out for that character arc, and then I know what is the climactic sort of battle, what's that setting, I can usually start to write. Writing a mist, a true mystery, most of my books have a mystery element to them, even though they're fantasy, but this one that's more of like a ghost story, like true mystery, has been one of the most difficult books I've ever written. It could be my perfectionism that's causing some of that because <laughs> I just want all those plants and reveals to be just completely perfect. But I do 
I will do sometimes character sketches, just really important for me to understand who this character is at the beginning of this book and who they need to be by the end. Right. And even though I have some long series, like my main series, the Shadow Demon Saga is 11 books with multiple spinoffs and things like that. And my Reem story will also be another spinoff of that world. Um, even though those are the, some of the same characters all the way through, they always still are growing. It's not a flat character arc. So if, I need to understand where are they at the beginning? Where have they just come from? What have they just learned? And who are they going to be at the end? And that for me informs so much of the actual plot of the book, because what do they need to go through and learn in order to be who they need to be at the end of this? So I do quite a bit of that type of work from the beginning. But then once I start writing, it's kind of an intuitive thing of like, okay, now I'm ready to get words on the page. Once I start seeing scenes in my head, like a movie, I know it's time to start writing stuff down. But as I go, it never follows my exact outline. And I leave myself open to, uh, to changing it. And sometimes I'll actually sit down and replot. And sometimes I won't. Sometimes I'll just say, well, let's see where it's, where it's carrying me. <laughs> And then inevitably, somewhere in the edits, I throw out 40,000 words and rewrite them. That's pretty much my process. Who doesn't? Who I mean, doesn't? You know, yeah, who doesn't? Let's be honest. Um, do you find that putting in that effort in the beginning of a writing project, does that help you in your day-to-day -day writing by knowing when you sit down, okay, this is the scene I need to write, and you've you've kind of already done the the, the heavy lifting uh, you know, so to speak that, okay, I already know what needs to be done. Now I just need to sit down and do it. Yeah. And it also helps me identify quickly what isn't working because I can sit down on paper and I can think, oh, I can see that scene playing out. I see how this character is going to be. And then if I sit down to write it, because I've got the scene card perfectly laid out, like on my scene cards, I try to say like, what's happening in the scene? Who's in this scene? What's my character's goal? And what's the obstacle to their goal and what's the outcome. I try to write that onto the scene cards uh, when I'm, when, before I start writing. So that gives me, and I can, if, if it goes the way I think it's going to go, I can write 2,500 words an hour. Amazing. If it doesn't, I know very quickly that there's something missing in the character arc or something I need to future think through what's the next couple of scenes. So it helps me identify pretty quickly where it's been challenging with my current book is that it's, it's two timelines and s multiple points of view. And that has been really difficult to keep track of because <laughs> when one thing changes with this character, it sometimes changes three or four things in right. that are happening with the other characters and piecing that puzzle together. I'm hoping on the other side of this book, man, I'm going to have really grown a lot <laughs> as a writer. <laughs> well, I as someone who is a writer and also does a lot of things um, about writing that's not necessarily writing, and and I find myself in in a similar situation in in you know working in marketing for a a company that makes software for writers, you can do a lot of things about writing all day long that have nothing to do with writing. You know that there's your story doesn't move forward, even though you're doing wonderful, good work. That's, yes. you know, doing one thing that, that I found is to remove the distractions of the internet and mm -hmm. this computer I have on my desk with multiple screens and just information everywhere. Sometimes I need to step away from all that to just be me and my story. And um, one thing that I picked up from one of your videos um, a while back and I'll grab it out of my backpack here. Ooh. Is this really nifty Bluetooth keyboard? Oh, yay. And you have one like it, I think, but it's, it's pink. pink. <laughs> um, mine is this um, kind of mint green, whatever. Um, but I have that, and I have uh, an old phone and uh, and a tablet that both have nothing on them but my writing software. Yeah. And I can put them in, and I can go out on the porch i can go uh you know down the street I, I can go somewhere where i'm away from my computer and i can just have me and my story and that has yeah. helped me enormously um yeah. are there things that you do to help shift gears from from the work of writing to actually writing or 
remove the distractions or whatever it is that helps you just kind of be alone with your story? So I also have, I kind of have a bunch of them back here. Um, for those of you yeah. that can see the video, I have Alpha Smarts and then Freewrite just came out with something called the Alpha that has been on, was on Indiegogo. I think I backed it two years yeah. ago and it just finally came and everybody's asking me, do you like it? I'm like, I cannot edit on that kind of device because mm. you get like two lines of text. Right. So I'm anxious to finish the current book and get started over there. But when I'm drafting, those kind of tools are really, really nice because you can just, like you said, completely tune out. But when I'm editing, I still want that functionality, but I need two screens or I need, you know, to be able to pull up everything I need. So I will turn on freedom which is an mm -hmm. app that I, I pay for. I think they do have a free version, but with the paid app, I can actually turn off every device I have with a click of my uh, browser. So I can turn off my phone, my laptop, my iPad, and my desktop computer's internet, but I can still maintain, like you can give it exceptions for which... Right. apps you want to still work. So I make sure that I can still use and access my Google Drive and I can still access... Uh, Spotify. And then I've got my music and I've got my, but I can't get lost in social media. There's no pings yeah. or anything else is going to come up and I can't turn it off. Once I've started it, it's, it's, it's on for two hours or whatever. And that's been super helpful because I found just an, another thing too, <laughs> that I've just started doing because when I started going out to Panera a lot, I started noticing that I thought, Oh, I've got all my stuff out. This is perfect for creating content. And so I would get lost in, let me make a reel and then let me post that to Instagram. And then every five or so minutes, I'd check to see, has anybody commented or, you know, and then I'd get lost for 10 minutes in social media, yeah. it's like hijacks my brain. And so I thought, okay, what can I do so I can still listen to my music and not get lost, you know, besides using freedom or, or anything like that. And what I decided to do is now I leave, I actually leave my phone in the car when I go out writing and I bought on Amazon for 30 bucks, like a, an MP3 player. And I actually had to Google, like, how do I even get MP3s anymore? <laughs> and I found a bunch of them. I was able to take all the ones I had uploaded to YouTube music like years ago and pull them all down and put them on this MP3 player that has no other access to anything. You can't do anything on it. And so taking my laptop and putting it on airplane mode, leaving my phone in the car so I'm not tempted to create content or check comments or right. anything else, and just having my Bluetooth headphones with that little MP3 player, game changer. Like you wouldn't think something so simple like going back in technology <laughs> would actually right. help, but it really, really has helped a lot. And I, I feel like having, I actually, the first time I did it, I had a little tick mark on my planner every time I reached for my phone and it wasn't there. And in a course of a two hour session, I had reached for my phone 10 times. And that's how often I'm interrupting my writing flow because when it gets hard, it's more, there's less resistance to checking Instagram or Facebook page or YouTube comment. Right. And so I have to just stick with the hard. Okay. The scene is difficult and it's not turning out the way I want. And I'm feeling uncomfortable and I'm going to allow myself to be uncomfortable in that for a little while until the answer comes. And that it's like retraining my entire brain. It's so worth it though. It it's is so worth it, you know, and <laughs> Oh man, uh, we could we could talk all day, Sarah. This is this has been so much fun. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna find a stopping place here. Um, if if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you're up to, where's the best place for them to find you online, Sarah? You know, YouTube is really one of the best places you can find me. My YouTube for my author facing stuff, my planners and, and coaching and Kanban boards and productivity is called heart breathings. And I also have a second YouTube channel. That's just my name, Sarah Cannon. And we do a live coffee chat every single Friday, which is just hanging out, answering questions, talking about manifesting and uh, productivity and my kids. And we just share kind of whatever comes up. It's a great, just incredible community. Um, I, 
strangely also have started Twitch streaming on Thursday night. So if you ever come look for Sarah Cannon on Twitch, I stream mostly uh, horror survival games on Thursday nights. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, also my website is sarahcannon.com. And if you search any place that sells books for beautiful demons, you will find a box set of my very first three young adult portal fantasy, contemporary fantasy books for free. Awesome. Awesome. We will link up all of that in the show notes to make it easier for folks to find whichever channel is uh, the most enticing for them. Um, but Sarah, you have a, a new release coming up soon. We hope in May. Um, Hopefully in May. I have not. Okay. I, I told myself after missing a pre-order a couple years back, I was not going to announce official release dates until I knew for certain everything was buttoned down. So I'm very close. Hopefully May. This book is called The Disappearance of Vanessa Shaw, and it is a YA supernatural thriller. Okay. Is it up for pre-order? It is not. Yeah, okay, it's not up for pre order. Okay. Well, we will link up your your Amazon profile in okay. the show notes. Where Perfect. folks can go check if it's available. And uh, when we see it's available, I'll try to up, update that link. to. Thank so you. if anybody you know finds this uh, video a couple months from now, they can run over and grab it. Um, Sarah, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you, Hank. I appreciate it.